I want to start tonight the book of Jeremiah, the first chapter of the book of Jeremiah. We're going to start in the fourth verse. The anointing, the last day anointing, what it means to you and I, what it meant to them, and what it's going to mean to those that, that, that come around you and I, all right? Jeremiah, the first chapter, the fourth verse says this, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I anointed thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, I want to stop there because I want you to understand that God uh, absolutely is no respecter of persons. Now, this may be hard for some of you to grasp onto, and I'm sure some of you may have already uh, studied this and know this, but bear with me here for a moment. The fact of it is that God knew us from the foundation of this world. You are not a mistake, all right? I, every once in a while I get people come and say, well, I was an unwanted child. Well, you may think you were unwanted by your mom and dad, but you're here because God wanted you here, okay? God does not make mistakes. And there's somebody out here tonight needs to hear that, so just gather that in and love it, okay? God does not make mistakes. So God, from the foundation of the world, he knew us, communicated with us, And bless God, and how did he do that? Spirit to spirit. That's the way he operates, all right? Now, because he did, and and in this case, he's telling Jeremiah. Now, remember, he's speaking specifically to Jeremiah. And he said, I knew you. Let me, let me, let me make sure I quote this right. He says, he said, before, before I formed thee in the belly. In other words, before you were in your mama's womb, I knew thee, and before you camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So where are we ordained by God from the foundation of the world? Now grab onto this. You and I, we knew each other from the foundation of the world. You and I knew each other. We communicated. We, we were more than, God communicated with us, all right? So, so we, we were in touch. I think the real neat part of this is, is to come to that point and realizing that now all we're really trying to do is once again hook back up that we're in these clothing bodies, first made what? Spirit, made in the image of God himself, and we're locked up into these clothing bodies and bless God, you know, we, and we, we operate, these bodies operate with what's called the five senses. The smell and the, the sight and the hearing and that stuff. Feel and all that, whatever I left out. But that's what the body operates by. Now the spirit doesn't operate according to the senses. The spirit operates by the spirit, all right, unto the spirit of God. Uh, once, once you see that we... Uh, can I say this politely, give up the ghost, we die, then we are able to come out of these clothing bodies and once again be that which we were created in the beginning, as spirit. So, it, uh, so, so when, when, when you begin, when you begin to, to look at this thing, you begin to study this thing, you begin to realize something that's of, of, of great importance, that, that God brought you forth for a reason. And the reason that you were ordained, and you were ordained. See, we go through this thing and, well, now, where were you ordained, Brother Deckard? I was ordained by God. Well, just what, where, where did you get ordained at? I said, from the foundation of the world. And here's the signs will confirm my ordination. I have no problem with that. I have no problem, as, I, as I've said, and I think most of you have heard me say, I give signs to presidents, to queens, to kings, to prime ministers all over this world. Signs that come to pass, not something that's come to pass 20 years from now. Signs that come to pass within three to seven days. They have all come to pass to this point. Now, it doesn't mean that next time I go that, uh, that it's guaranteed that that'll come to pass because it, it, has all, it has everything to do with my hookup with God, just like with your hookup with God. And that's what we want to get you to this weekend is so you can begin to understand that, number one, you and God communicated from the foundation of this world. You communicated. And through that communication, there was an agreement made. And the agreement made with, with God and you was, this is what I, the Lord God, have commissioned you to do, and this is what you're going to do at the given time in which he gives us to do it. It's just, and, and, you, and you see, the, the, the wild thing about this, we read in the scriptures, and thank God for the scriptures, 
But we read in the scriptures about the prophets. We read about this man Elijah that could bring fire down from heaven. We, 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 you know, we, 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 we read about the things of the raising the dead and the, the meal barrel not going dry and the cruise of oil having a cruise in it throughout the three and a half year drought in Elijah's day that happened with the widow lady and her son. And, and we look at those things and we go, wow, these are really something. I, I wish that Elijah was here today. Guess what? Elijah is here today. Hello, Elijahs. Amen. You're here. You're not here by mistake. You're not here by some misappointed time by God. We are all that God has. And he will do through us as he did through them if we are ready to comply to him. And that's where the key is at. Now, you go back and you begin to, you begin to, to, to look at where the church has come in, in, in 2,000 plus years. How far have we come? Well, you know, the thing that just absolutely gets under my skin and does it real quick, we have come nowhere. We, we have digressed. We haven't, we haven't proceeded forward. There are not enough men and women walking the face of this earth today that can ever stand and claim to ever see one blind eye open, one deaf ear ever come open, let alone anybody dead that's ever been raised in the name of Yeshua. And you know that, and I know that, because I travel the world and I see it. And it isn't because I do it, I stand here and point a finger and accuse them. It's because I do it because I found out a way that it works. And you know what the way is? It's called not compromising God. That's what it's called. It is called what I said earlier. God is going to bring the last day believer back to holiness. And we're going to walk in it. We're going to talk it, we're going to live it, and we're going to be it. Now, so, so God says, to, to, says to, to, to me, he says, Now, Deckard, I, I, I've anointed you, and I'm going to bring you forth in, 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 in um, what's called the, the last generation. And I said, Well, Lord, you know, I, 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 I'd, I'd rather Jeremiah, you know, I mean, look at what he did. I'd rather, I'd rather Elijah be there because look what he did. Do you know what God says? You don't understand. They have no more than you've got. Say they. they. Come on, they, they. Have, no more have no more than what I got. What I and that's the truth. You're walking in it. You just don't know what to do with it. You're kind of like a dog with a new bowl. You're looking at it. You don't know whether to drink out of it, eat out of it. You're just, well, there's a new bowl. Okay? And the fact of it is the church hasn't come far enough in 2,000 years to bless God, because let me tell you why I know that. We are supposed to be, by now, working the greater works of God. That was commissioned to us from the foundation of the world, too. We are to be working the works of God. And what we're still trying to do for the most, and I'm going to talk about the overall church now. I'm going to talk about everything from the, from the Roman Catholics to the charismatic movement. For the most part, we're still trying to decide if there even be a Rahakadish, a Holy Ghost. We're still trying to decide if it's either, and then we don't understand the very principle of God, which is called what? Unity. We do not understand the principle. So God gave us 2,000 years during a time that he deemed through, through, through the Apostle Paul to call dispensation of grace. Simply a time for us to get this thing straightened around and get it right. And guess what? We didn't. Dispensation of grace is for, for all uh, sense of the word, is, uh, words are, is over. We are about to now be catapulted by God into a transition period in a time. And it will be the last transition that the church on the face of this earth will ever know. It will be the greatest move of God, even that which Elijah saw, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Peter, Paul, and the rest of them. This will surpass everything that they did, my brothers and my sisters. And yet you and I are sitting back, and we're trying, to, we're trying to say, well, you know, God told me this and God told me that. Let me tell you something. Do yourself a favor and do God a favor and shut your mouths and quit saying God told you anything. Work the works of God. That's what God wants. He's not interested in a bunch of happy words coming out of people's mouths. What he's interested in is what you and I are going to do to bring the rest of that dying world out there into his kingdom. That's what he's after, and you and I can't produce that because if we could, we'd be getting it done. Amen? 
So, so, so we have now come to that place. And God said, I have given you. We don't have Peter. We don't have Paul. We don't have Elijah. What we got is you and I. But we sat there when they sat there at the foundation. We were there when they were there. They came, they did their lot, and they passed by. Now it's our turn. It's our turn. What are we going to do? What are we going to do now? Well, now, Brother Deckard, I just plan to sit on back and wait till you know. No, 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 no. This is our generation. It's our time. It's our anointing. We're the ones that would God save to bring forth in this hour. If he wanted Jeremiah here, Jeremiah would have been here. But he didn't want Jeremiah here. He wanted you and I here. And the sad indictment against you and I is very simple. We not only don't work the works of God, dear God in heaven, we can't see a sick cow be healed. Most of the time. And yet we're the ones running around saying, we believe God for this, we believe God for that. Do you know the thing I, I say to so many people around the United States? What makes you different than the people across the street from you that you know are heathens? What makes you different? What makes you stand out and everybody say, well, you know, I want to be like them and, and I, I want to go to where they go to church. And I, I want to, I, you know, what, what, what makes you different? Or is it the fact that you not only pretty well look like everybody else because we've let so much of the church, let the world that's come into the church, I mean, that, that we don't look any different anymore than they look. Not a bit different. Irene was telling me today that the statistic came out here this last month or so. There's now saying that we've got more divorce in the church than they got in the world. Or as much as. I'm not sure which that was. But anyway, it's equal to now, if not more so. Well, what is this about? Folks, it's about wrong teaching and wrong believing. It's just that simple. We've been taught wrong and we've believed wrong. And now that we've done that, and some of us see the remnant of God is beginning to be pulled out from among this nation. And, and I, 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 Don and I, we are so in awe every place that we go. The pastor, uh, uh, Brother Paul, when we were there with, with, uh, with uh, Pedro uh, Valdez and, and Adrian, he opened his arms up and embraced this thing like it was a long lost brother. He didn't know anything about it. When I finished, he said, that's what I've looked for all my life. That's it. What's, what's going on? The anointing of God is beginning to penetrate the walls. The walls. Can I, can I say the prisons of the church? And the prisoners are starting to do what? Being set free. And I'm going to tell you something. Once you get set free, you're going to be free. Okay? You're going to be free. He goes on to say something. He said, Then said I, uh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I'm a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I'm a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. Now, now, does this happen to everybody? No, this doesn't happen to everybody. It doesn't take place with everybody. This took place with Jeremiah. So God said, you speak because my words are now in your mouth. And of course, you, you read the rest of uh, the book of Jeremiah and you, 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 you become astounded at the things in which the Lord God did what? Like he, he had him to speak and how it came to pass and how the Lord God said the things that he said and the way that he said them. And, and you know, when you stand back and you look at it and you begin to look at it, you're saying, well, yeah, but they were this, they were that. But don't forget what I told you when we began this thing. I simply said what? You knew him too. You were there. We were together. He, he, Jeremiah stood up. God spoke to him. God said, this is what you're going to do. Now listen closely, because some of you are going to have to really grasp onto this. It has been ordained from the foundation of the world what you are to do for God. Do you know what most people spend their lifetime doing? Trying to find out if there's a connection between them and God. Not even knowing that there already is let alone understanding what it is that God put them here on this face to the face is there to do. You know what peace is? It's understanding what God has you here for. That's what real peace is all about. When you understand what God has got you here for, peace will come upon you like a, like a river. First Chronicles, if you'll turn there with me in the 16th chapter. First Chronicles 16. 
I've got a lot of one verses here, but I want to get through this tonight because I've got a I've got a bundle of stuff to do over this weekend. First Chronicles 16, 22. It says, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Now notice that there's a comma after the word anointed. So God distinguishes a difference. And most people think, well, it's, he, he's just talking about the prophets. No, no, touch not mine anointed. Who are his anointed? You are his anointed. Touch him not. You realize that, you know, and, and, and some of you have heard the stories that I've told. I mean, I, 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 there, there's, a, there's a, a list of, of people that, that have, have done me as a prophet harm that today are dead. And they're dead because they touched something that God didn't want touched. You just don't, you don't monkey with the prophets. You know, I, I have said for years, you may not like me, you may not want to be around me, but do yourself the biggest favor you're ever going to do yourself. You leave, keep your mouth shut, and go about your business. Because if you don't, God's going to get you. Because I am a prophet of God. And this isn't a game. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, this, this is hardball. This is what this thing's all about. You want to know why, how a prophet operates? I'm going to teach you this weekend how a prophet operates. Can you operate like what I operate? Yes, to degrees you can. And, we're going to, uh, and, and you're going to leave here this weekend. Like I said, when I bring out the, the, the horn of oil, I'm going to pour oil on you. So you don't want to come here, you don't want to come here Sunday with, with your Sunday meeting clothes on thinking that, well, you better wear something that, bless God, that you can wash and, and Donna can tell you how to get all that oil out anyway. It'll come out, girls. Okay? I know it might, it might undo your Sunday best hairdo, but uh, you'll get over that. The anointing will be worth, worth that. So, so uh, touch not my anointed. Now, now here is, here is something that I've said for, for, I guess, the beginning of my ministry. Everybody has an anointing. The key is how do you bring forth that anointing out of your life? And how do you know for a fact that the anointing that you're trying to bring forth is what God really ordains you with from the foundation world? Well, we're, we're going to talk probably quite a bit about that through the next uh, a few meetings because you need to understand that, that everything that's done is supposed to be judged by the prophets. Now, now we, we have to, we judge the spiritual things of the church. The spiritual things we judge. So is this a spiritual matter? You bet this is a spiritual matter in your life. It is the anointing that God has given you. Anointings are very, very, very special things. All right? Uh, I have often said if the Lord God would appear to me today and said, Deckard, uh, I'm, 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 I'm going to lift the anointing from you and, and so... Uh, but you go on down to preach tonight. You know what I told the Lord? I'll take my stripes on that day. I quit. I am an anointing junkie. I have, to, I have to have the anointing work in me like people have to take uh, 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 these drugs that they take. Because it, it's, it, it's there. I, you're, people say to me, do you, do you do two meetings a day? Honey, I'll do three meetings a day if you'll, you'll put up with me. Why? Because I live for the anointing. I live for God in me and God, what God does through me. And I will continue to live that way. Why? Because it is me given in my life to you. And that's what your anointing is supposed to See, the anointing is not for you. See, and sometimes we misunderstand that. The anointing of God doesn't work for you. The anointing of God works for others. And, and, and we'll, we're going to talk about some of that as we, we get through this. But, but I want you to know, there again, touch not mine anointed. So God doesn't want any of us touched. Why? Because God placed something in you that is absolutely valuable to Him. You know what God placed in you? He placed in you a commission for you to go forth into this world when it's your time and for you to perform the, His works. Now, He invested in you from the foundation of the world and he wants to get what he invested in you out of you. See, I, I, I think that most of us are trying to find a way to make God work through us. And what we don't understand is, you're here so God can work through you. I don't mean in this room tonight. I mean you're on this earth so God can work through you. So God can be what he wants to be in you and what he ordained you. See, he told you something at the foundation of the world too. He spoke and told you something. 
And what he told you was just as personal as what he told Jeremiah. Now, obviously, what he told Jeremiah didn't end up real personal because he put it in the book, all right? But the fact of the matter is, he spoke to you and he became very personal with you about your anointing that is his, and he told you what it was that you were going to do with that anointing when it was your turn to be here on this earth. Now, uh, if you begin to let your, let your, let your head uh, begin to, to bless God, to begin to comprehend some of this, you'll, you'll begin to say, oh, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then, then bless God, you know, it's not a matter of me trying to talk God into it. See, see what, some of us think it's a matter of how many prayers we pray. It's a matter of how many days that we fast. It's a matter of how much scripture we read. It's a matter of how many times we attend church. And it's none of that. It's none of that at all. It is the anointing that God put in you from the foundation of the world that God is desperately trying to get you to come to a place where you can use that anointing, whatever it is. Let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 10. 1 Samuel 10. And, and you know, I, I, I think that, that through, through what I have what I have watched through the years, and, and I've, I've watched a lot of it, I, I, begin, I begin to realize some things about, about the things of God and the way God does what He does and why He does what He does. And you know, the, the most of what I see in people's lives, I, I, people are afraid to step out in faith. And, and when, you, when, you get, when you get to the point where you're afraid to step out in faith, do you know what happens? Then you withdraw yourself and you take yourself and the anointing that was given to you by God from the foundation, and you set it aside. Uh, the, the thing that I love, and I get very strong about the people that think they're hearing from God, and it's a familiar spirit, because there's a danger in that. But let me tell you what the other danger is. is those of you that bless God, that know that God deals with you, and you're too backward, and you're too shy, because after it all, it's just me, Lord. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking to tonight, because you're here. You see, that's also a danger. Because you see, what, what I have been able to, 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 through the years, to understand is it's really quite simple that the devil comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he doesn't care how he gets this from you or keeps you from operating in it. He just wants to do it. So he'll use a number of ways. Some of the things that we began, we opened up tonight with when we begin to pray and begin to make sure that you, your hearts were clean is, is part of that. If he can keep you upset with somebody, if he can get you to the place where you're holding a grudge or, or unforgiveness or however you want to deem that, do you realize that he won? Because see, that's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. It works through a, through a broken and a contrite spirit. That's the way it operates. Uh, uh, 1 Samuel, uh, let's see, I'm still looking for the 10. Uh, 1 Samuel 10, and, and, and in the 10th chapter, we're going to go 1 through 7 here, okay? Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon the head, his head, and kissed him, and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Now, now this is, of course, about, uh, about who I call a, a king for a day, um, uh, Saul. And thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men at Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelazah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left, uh, left the, the care of the asses and sorrow for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shall thou go forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there will meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou, shalt, thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a palsy and with a tabret and with a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Now I want to stop there for a minute. Now this is a true prophet of God, which I don't think anybody in this room would want to stand up and say, say he's not, uh, as, as being Samuel. Now notice how Samuel was in operation here. Samuel began to point out specific things. 
specific things. And he told him, he said, you're going to find out that, you know, about, the, about these asses. And he said that you're going to go along. You're going to meet these guys. They're going to give you this. Then you're going to meet the, 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 the prophets that are coming down for the hill. And they're going to prophesy. And now, now notice what he did, though, in the, first, in the first verse. Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him. That's the thought he did. What did he do? He anointed him. Now listen to what he says in the sixth verse. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Do you know what that is? That is the anointing. That is the anointing. I, I, I think that if Donna could come tonight, and, and, and she could stand here, and if there's one thing that she could, would, would probably like to say, say to all of you, uh, because most of you here do know us somewhat, but some of you don't, and hopefully by the weekend you, you, over you'll know us better. But you see, if you only know me under this anointing, all you see is a hard-nosed prophet that, I, that honestly, it, it bothers me less what you think, what you care, anything. All that bothers me is to deliver what God's dropped into my bucket so that I can be obedient to God. That's what prophets do. I've done it for 30 years, and that's what I do. Now, what Donna will tell you is, what you have missed is a big teddy bear. You have missed a guy that's heart's as big as this room, that cries buckets of tears, but nobody ever sees that. Why? Because I'm the prophet. I, this anointing, when the anointing, Donna can tell you when this anointing comes on me, she doesn't know who I am. She no more knows what's going to get ready to happen than, 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 than anybody sitting in the room. Because I, why? Because the anointing comes. Now listen, the anointing will change you. Say the anointing, the anointing. will change me. Will change me. And that's what's going to happen to you this weekend. The anointing is going to change you. And you're going to become another man. Which means you're not going to be trying to operate within your own strengths, your own weaknesses, your own intelligence. No, no, you're going to become another man, man or woman, another man, and you're going to be taken over by the Spirit of God. How do you, now, how do you, how do you think that, that I can know? How could I know? I, I made mention here uh, some things as we were praying that some of you had need to go do. How do I know that? Because I became that other man. I began to let the anointing operate through me instead of me trying to do what? Instead of me trying to sit here and say, well, let me name all this stuff, and if I get any one of them right, then somebody say amen. See, that's what the anointing is. I have learned to let the anointing take over, and I've learned to get out of the way. Uh, early on in, in my ministry, right here in this room, this is the first church that we ever built. We built seven, and this is here in the States, and this is the first one that we, we ever built was right here. And, and uh, I, was, I was young. I hadn't been in the ministry but a couple years when we, we built this church. And, and so I, I, I had experiences because I was learning and God was teaching me about the anointing. And, and so one night, one night the Lord God said to me, he said, tonight I'm going to do something very special. And he said, I want you to be ready. And he said, I want you to, to, to understand what's going to happen. And I said, what's going to happen? And he said, I am going to take you out of your body. I said, well, Lord, that's kind of scary. Did, didn't that mean I'm dead? He said, oh, no, 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 not at all. He said, I'm going to take you out. And, and so I was preaching that night right here on this, on, this, on this podium, and I was preaching, and all of a sudden I, I, was, I was doing like this, and all of a sudden I turned, and I was standing back there in the middle of those doors, and I was looking at me up here preaching. And I was, I was hearing, I was hearing me preach. I was seeing me preach. And the Lord God spoke to me and the Lord said to me, after he brought me back and put me back into my body, the Lord said to me, he said, understand, son, that I am the Lord God and if you'll yield yourself to me, there's nothing, there is nothing that'll be impossible to you. See, we, we, we get into this thing, we read the scriptures and, and, we, and what we don't understand by, by the things that we read, we believe that just because the Lord God says, uh, you know, ask and ask and whatever you ask, it'll be done in my name. Well, that's true, but there's a prerequisite to all that. There again, there are certain fulfillments that we're going to have to do to be able to do what? To be able to ask. See, we, uh, we do a lot of asking, but we do very little receiving, don't we? Well, you know, that, that's, uh, that's something for another, for another subject matter. 
But he said that he had turned to another man. And, and seven verse says, And let it, be, let it be when these signs are come upon thee that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Now, this is big time prophetic stuff. All right? Now, now Saul was not uh, the pick of, of, of Samuel. Samuel was not at all for Israel to have a king. But you see, Israel wanted a king. I mean, why not? The Hittites and the Prezersites and all the rest of the sites had king. We want a king. We want to be like them. And God said, Samuel was mad. And God said, let him have a king. It's not going to work. Let him have a king. It didn't work, did it? Do you know what's going on in Israel today for parallelization of that day of Samuel? Today, they, they in the government, the Knesset in, in, in Israel, is now wanting to push, push religion completely out of the government, completely out. Will they get that done? I don't know for sure. I would say by the scriptures, probably yes. But the fact of it is, what do they want? They want a king again, don't they? It looks like they would have learned something through all these years. It didn't work then. It's not going to work now. What they need is the guidance of God. And I've said for a long, long time, when Israel decide, decides that God is with us, this thing will be over. All right, but Israel's still trying to play some kind of a game that Israel can't win without without God. Let's go. Let's go to First Kings. Let's go to First Kings seventeen one. First Kings seventeen one. Now, the, the, of course, this is this is our, our our friend Elijah the Tishbite. Now, 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 listen to what he says here. Who was of the uh, and Elijah the Tishbite? who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor no rain these years, but according to my word. Now, I should have told you to keep your finger back over there in 1 Samuel 10. Okay? Or 1 Samuel, not Samuel's. 1 Samuel 10. Uh, because what I want you to do is, or I'll, I'll read it to you. He said that thou do in the seventh verse, as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Now, this is, as I said, big time stuff. But we see over here that evidently God is, tends to be that way because he, he, with Elijah, he said it's not going to rain for these years according to my word. He, he didn't say God told him to say that. He didn't say anything about God telling him to do anything. He just said according to my word. Now, can and does God honor words that are spoken by people. Yes, he does, but listen closely. Not until he is sure that you are not going to absolutely take it and, and absolutely blow the whole thing with it. When God, uh, uh, seven, eight years ago, the Lord God finally spoke to me and said to me, he said, son, he said, you now become my friend. Then I thought, well, Lord, I, th I thought I was your friend. I mean, I've <laughs> been doing this for <laughs> a lot of years. I thought, I mean, you know, I thought, I thought, you know, we were friends. And, and, and until that time when the Lord God would say to me, I want you to go before this president or this king or who are prime minister, and I want you to prophesy. And I want you to tell them, thus saith the mouth of God, and I want you to leave a sign that they'll know that the Lord God sent a prophet to them. Every time I'd say, that's fine, Lord, I'll be glad to do that, but first you're going to give me a sign. You say, you do that? You bet I used to do that. You better believe I did that. You want to know why? Because, folks, I understand something about familiar spirits. A familiar spirit, you see, you don't get a monopoly on this thing. See, we get to thinking that we get to a certain place, and all of a sudden, the, the uh, familiar spirit, the darkness can't come in. And I got news for you, if that's where you're at in your life, you're done. You're done, been had. The goose has been cooked. Put a fork in it. It's over. Because the fact of the matter is, the powers of darkness can come to you in the form of an angel of light at any point and any time of your walk on the face of this earth while you're in flesh and you're in blood. Now, so I, so I just go to the Lord. I said, okay, now Lord, you give me a sign and I'll do that. And, and, and the Lord would come back to me and say, well, what would the sign be? If you have to have a sign, what would it be? And so I'd tell him, and, that, and then he would give me the sign, and then I'd say, I'll go. That went on for 20 years. 20 years it went on. If Stephen would have been here, and he wanted to be, but couldn't be here, 
from uh, Barbados and West Indies, uh, Stephen could come up here and he could tell you about some things that he watched me do by the signs that God gave me that, that would, that he spent hours standing up here telling you. The fact of it is, I'm not telling you that to entertain you, I'm telling you that that's how sure that I am that a, that a, that a familiar spirit can come in. And you have to understand, folks, you're never going to get to the place where you're just so automatically so tight with God that the powers of darkness can't get in there. Because they can and they do. So the years passed and then as I said, the Lord spoke to me and the Lord said to me this. He said, now, he said, you don't have to ask me for signs anymore so that you'll go do what it is that I want you to do. He said, I will honor the words that you speak. And I thought, wow. I thought, Lord God, I, I, don't, I don't know whether I want to do that. I don't know, I don't know whether I want the responsibility of, of, of having to, you know, of, of speaking. You know why? Huh? You die, you're dead. You understand what I said? Be healed and you're healed. Be this or be that. And it's going to happen. And I'm going, Lord God, that, 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 that's such a responsibility. How, how could you? Hey, he said, because I can trust you. And see, the key of the anointing is to God to get you in a position where he can trust you to turn you loose with the kind of power that causes the dead to come up in the name of his son, Yeshua. And that's where the key's at in this thing, is his trust in you. And if he can't trust you, guess what? He's not going to use you. Now let's go back again. Can he use you? Yes, he can use you. Are you anointed to God? From the foundation of this world you are. Then the problem isn't God, is it? The problem isn't how many prayers, it isn't how many uh, chapters a day you read in the Bible, it's not how many days did you fast, it's not how many days you stand on your head and turn in circles in a corner and whistle Dixie. What it has to do is with you giving yourself to God. And if, in fact, you're willing to go that far. See, some people just aren't willing to go that far. Uh, back, to, back to 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16, and in the seventh verse. It says here, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on, on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not a man as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh upon the heart. Now where is God looking at you tonight? Upon your heart. See, that's the reason as we started tonight that I, I was very, very so adamant about the fact that you get clean in your heart. Get your heart cleaned up. Give God the opportunity to use you. Because God looketh what? He looks upon the heart. It's the, it's the purposes and the intents of the heart that God judges. It isn't the flesh. See, we, we get, we're all wrapped up into this. Well, you know, the old Pentecostal movement, bless their hearts, they, 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 they had such a time because you go and, bless God, the same group would get saved this week that got saved last week. And, and, and you know, I never can understand, understand that. And I, I kept, you know, I asked the pastor, well, what in the world's going on here with all this? How, how could this be? Well, you know, of course, they had all these wild answers that they had, but you know what, you know what in essence it was all about? is because they didn't know who he was and who he is and who he's going to be. Not only for now, but forever and ever and ever and ever. And folks, eternity's a long time. Amen? So how long were you with God from the foundation of the world until he brought you forth in this generation? Well, I, I don't know. Come on, how long? We don't have any, any account of what it was and the dates of the time when the foundations of the world was laid by God. And that we all gathered. Now let me give you something else that's going to blow you away. Do you realize that now that the Lord God is bringing forth what he's bringing forth, that the people that were gathered at the foundation that he spoke to, assigned all this stuff to, is about over. The room's about empty, folks. It's about over. It isn't, you see, you see, it's not everybody, not everybody. You're chosen of God, and, and, and that's what you've got to understand. You're of a royal priesthood. You're not the back end of a donkey. You're not somebody out here, bless God, that doesn't deserve the best. You are the best because God made you the best. 
It isn't something that, bless God, that you just half-heartedly into. And it isn't through all these plans and these seven steps to heaven and all the things that we've been to, through all these charismatic and Pentecostal and Baptist and Catholic seminars that go on, it has to do with your heart. And that's all that it has to do with. And once that you can get your heart straightened up, then God is going to move you into position to let you receive it. Now, 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 now in the 11th verse, it says, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, uh, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in, and, and now he was ruddy and with, with all of a beautiful countenance, and godly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon on David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now let's see, we saw him pouring that oil on Samuel, didn't he? Mm-hmm. But he also anointed David. And he brought forth David. So now, now can we say that, well, that there's more than one anointed vessel on the earth at the time? Yes, we can say that. We're all anointed. And that, that, that's the reason that, that, as you read, see, the, the, the Bible, the scriptures of God were given to us for admonition, to, to, to build us up. So that we could understand. And what, what God has done in all this, he has chosen and brought forth. Now, we're going to talk seriously uh, uh, sometime within this, I, uh, sometime tomorrow, about the chosen of God. And there, there's a big difference between the, the anointed and the chosen. And, and there's a huge difference in that, and we're, we're going to get to that. But we want to concentrate not on the fact, and the only reason I want to get to the chosen is I want you to understand the difference in those, but I also want you to understand that the, the, the main principle of this thing is to bring forth the anointing out of your life. That is what we're here about, is for you to work the works of God. I didn't come here to impress you by laying hands on the blind, the lame, the deaf, the dumb, the, the halt, the sick, the short legs, the long legs, the crooked legs, the twisted heads. and I didn't, I, I didn't come here to display that to you by the hand of God. I came here to do what? To anoint you and bring you forth. But in order for me to do that, I have to have you come into a place a full understanding of what this thing's all about that you're about to get anointed to and for. Because you've got to understand that. You see, when you back up and you don't realize what God's doing, the devil will come in and do what? He'll steal so quick it won't be funny. Let's go to Isaiah 10. And of course, this, this is a scripture that I'm sure that you've heard over and over and over again. Isaiah 10, uh, uh, 27, it just simply says, uh, and it shall come to pass in the last day that his burden shall be taken away from thy, off thy shoulder and the yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So the key to this is very simple. The key is to understand that the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. What destroys the yoke? Come on, what destroys the yoke? Say, I'm anointed. My anointing will destroy the yoke. yoke. That's simple. It's that simple. You said, now wait a minute, it was that simple, why haven't I worked it? Because the things that we're going to get into this weekend of trying to get you to understand what you're going to have to do. If you're going to carry, if you're going to carry the kind of anointing that will raise the dead, then you're going to have to, you're going to have to look across the street at your neighbor and you better be able to say, this is why I'm a Christian and they're a heathen. You better say, this is what makes me different than them. Yeah, and, and, so, and the right answer to that is, well, you have, you have Yeshua, you have Jesus. And that's right. But you see, folks, there's got to be more than that uh, because that, that, you know, the, the, the principles of where the church got so monkeyed up with this thing was, was, was very, very basically simple that we, we, we took and we did like all things that we seem to do with anything. We went to seed with it. The Lord Yeshua Jesus came to this earth for one principle, one and only one. He came here to fulfill what the law could not do. The law could not get us to heaven. He came 
shed his blood so that we could have everlasting life. That is why he came. The covenant of God, which God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and everybody else, was given to us in order for us to be able to live on this earth by that covenant until the time came when we gave up the ghost and we did what? We could then go to heaven. That's what he came for. Now, he did give us the power and the authority of his name, which we're going to get into that because of the important, very important, all right? But the problem is, folks, the church went to seed with this thing, and we went to the, such a point is we've got Jesus, and we've got everything, and we don't need anything else. You don't need anything else after you give up the ghost because he came and gave it to you. The problem is, what are we going to do between the time that we received him and we go to heaven? That's the question that's got to be posed to the church. And that's the question that you are going to have to answer. We all have to answer. And the answer is very simple. The fact of it is that God made a covenant with his children. And he said, if you do this, I'll do that. If you don't do this, I can't and won't do that. And then, then, as I told you, when you read in, in Deuteronomy 28 and you get down through uh, chapter or verses 15 back through, I think, 68, you'll find something out through there. Every one of those curses that are spoke about in the, in the chapter 28 of, of Deuteronomy. In the every time I go to have a meeting. Every time. Now, uh, what's this about? He either is God or he either isn't God. He either takes away all of our infirmities, or he doesn't. Or is it because somehow or other we misunderstood? Well, I, I, I'm assured that we misunderstood. I think that, as I said, I think we got duped, and I think we have been duped, and I think the duping is over. I think the prophets are standing up now and saying, the naked, the king is naked. And I believe that. I believe that we're saying, we're saying it all over the world. It's time to stand up and smell the roses. It's time, church, that we grow up. It's time that we get away from, we get away from this, the, 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 the sincere milk of God's word and we finally get over into the depths of God's word, that we grow up. The problem, the church has never grown up, but we all think that we are. You can't imagine traveling this country, what, what Don and I see and how sad that it is. People sitting, believing that they absolutely, and I said it earlier, believe that God's leading them here and God's leading them there and it's a stinking familiar spirit that's got a hold of them and they don't even know it. And that, and that is sad, okay? Let's, uh, let's, uh, let's go to, uh, let's go to, uh, back to 1 Samuel 24. I guess I'll tell you, keep your finger there. I'm about, about done there. I've got 2 Samuel I'm coming to. So but go to, to 24, 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel 24, 4th verse, 1 Samuel 24, 4. And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord saith unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privately. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. You need to underline that. David's heart smote him. He didn't have somebody come up and judge him. I said the Holy Ghost, the Rehokodesh, will come upon you and do what? Convict you. All right? And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. Did David have every reason in the world to do him in? You bet he did in the world's eye. But what, what did David come up with here? He said, he is the Lord's anointed. He is the Lord. Did, did David agree with Saul? Not at all. Did David badmouth Saul? No. Did David sow discord? No. What did David do? He honored the anointing that God had poured upon him. We have no honor amongst us in the church. One for another, minister to minister, or anybody else. There is no honor amongst us. We do not honor each other. What we do is we destroy each other by the words that we speak against each other. That's what we do. And you see, all of this is given to us so that we can learn something. 
We never learn anything because what the church does is the church judges and the church sows discord. And, and, you, and, and we don't have any idea because we're doing that. We have already destroyed, now listen closely to me, any type of anointing working at any depth in us at all. We destroyed it. God didn't call you to judge. He'll take care of that. It's not up to you to decide whether I'm a prophet or I'm not a prophet. I have to stand before God just as you've got to stand. And the Lord God will judge me upon those bases of that day. So why should you bother and get yourself in a mess so that you're down here on this earth all monkeyed up because you've got to somehow decide that I'm not a right about something that you want to be right about. Grow up. Grow up and understand what this is about. You are to... You are to honor the anointed vessels of God. They're to be honored. They're not supposed to be God to be slandered. God did that. What did you say? Do my prophets no harm? Why did he say that? He said it because he meant it. Do you understand that from the foundation of this world that we spoke about tonight, the investment that God has put into some of us surpasses? It comes to a place that's deeper than some of the other anointings. And I probably said that out of turn because I needed to get to the scripture, but I, I'm not sure I'm going to get there tonight. It'll be tomorrow. But you need to understand that. I make statements, and, I, and it amazes me how some people get all, all upset over a statement that I made. Don't, you know what the Lord Yeshua said? Don't judge me. Judge me for the work's sake. See, that, that, that judge me for the work's sake. How, how can you... How, and you know something? I've had people come to me and say, well... You know, Brother Deckard, I think that you do all this healing and these miracles. The, the, the Bible says in the last day, and, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord's judge, the Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. Quite a statement in it. He said, my hand shall not be upon thee. Now, 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 now here's a man that, that Saul was trying to kill him. He was, getting, he was jealous of David and wanted to get rid of David. The fact of it is, David, David was convicted. The Spirit of God convicted him. And David came forth and said, look, I, right here is your robe. He said, I, I could have killed you, but I didn't because I will not touch the anointed of the Lord. I'll not do that. Now, where did David end up? David ended up being spoken of in the Bible as the apple of God's eye. The apple of his eye. Could David have killed Saul and got, uh, got through that and still been king? Yeah, he could have. But I'm going to tell you one thing that he couldn't have done. He couldn't have performed by the anointing the things that he performed. Because why? He was cutting himself short with God because of his flesh. The biggest culprit that you and I have is our minds and our flesh. Your mind and your flesh will beat you out of everything that God's got if you let it. That's the reason that you must come to that place and you must come to that place of agreement in your hearts and in your minds that you want God more than you want yourself. That's really what David was doing. David was really saying, look, I know, Saul, that you're trying to kill me, but you know what, where, where, the, where the whole thing came in that 12th verse when he says, the Lord judge between me and thee. He said, let the, George, let the, let the Lord judge this. And you want to know something? Let God judge those. Get out of judgment. If there's one thing today that I can tell you standing here that I believe would be the smartest thing for you to get out of your life, it's judgment. Get it out of your life. Get it gone. Want God more than you want to play whatever it is that you want to play because you want to be right. But because you want to know what the real truth of the matter is, it doesn't make any difference whether you're right. Boy, that got quiet, didn't it? It doesn't make any difference whether you're right. What makes a difference is, is your heart. That's what makes a difference. It's your heart. And, and, and you know, people, people get all bum it up with this thing, and some believe that, 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 you know, that somehow that they've got all this going on, and, and well, God wants me. You know, I, I, I knew a, a woman one time that said that God had commissioned her to see to it that she destroyed my ministry. That she destroyed it. That was her commission by God. And you know, that was, that, you know, I looked at her and I said, well, honey, let me just tell you one thing. If God be God and he is, then you better bring your lunch bucket and a big bottle of water because you're going to be here a while. 
Because I said, this, I, used, I said, this isn't my ministry to start out with, it's God's. If God anointed me from the foundation and brought me forth, I said, you nor no one else is going to be able to do anything against me until it be the time that Lord God would permit that to be done. And that's all there is to it. Now, I, I say that because I'm, I've traveled this world. I've, I've had my life on the line more than, than I would, wouldn't even have to stand up here and talk to you about. But God has delivered me from all of that. You know why? Because I kept my heart clean. I kept my heart right. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to understand. If I gave you anything tonight, it would be take judgment out of your hearts. Get rid of it. Get it get far from you. Let's go to, let's go to, uh, to 23, 1 and 2. 23, 1 and 2 of, of, of 2 Samuel. Um, first two verses here. It says, Now these be the last words of David. David the son of Jesse said, And the man who was raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, and of the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word in, was in my tongue. Now, does that not what we heard the Lord God say to Jeremiah? Now, I'm in 2 Samuel 23, 1 and 2. Is that not what he, he talked about, about his, his, his word was in my tongue? See, God will, put his, God will put his word in your tongue. All right? And, and he will do that. Now, now, now by, by what means? I mean, will an angel come? Maybe. Will he speak to you? Maybe. May he do whatever he do? Yes. But you see... Uh, David wouldn't have been able to have said that as he was about to leave this earth. But the fact of it was, because his heart was right, he could say that. And see, again, folks, that's where this is at. That's where the depth of this thing is. The depth of this thing is not, is not uh, getting ourselves all, all caught up in, in, in the, old, the, the, you know, the uh, Holy Ghost goosebumps and thinking, well, this is the anointing. No, what the anointing is, is talking about you getting your heart in position where your heart is capable of producing the things of God. Now, let me ask you this. Would God, would God have, have uh, uh, killed, uh, killed Saul if he would have been David? No, he wouldn't have. Now, did God judge Saul? You bet God did, and we're going we're gonna to get to that uh, tomorrow sometime. Let's go, to the, let's go to the New Testament now. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. Some one verses here. 20th chapter of Matthew, 16th verse. So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. So the last shall be first, the first shall be last. How, how many of us are wanting to be first? Huh? See, we've got it back, 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 backward. See, don't want to be first because the first are going to be last. It's the last that's going to be first. So, but we're all want to be first. Do you know that what most ministry is? Most ministry is in competition. And most ministry is competing against each other so that somebody will think, oh my, I believe he is a better minister than he or she. I believe that she's much better than they are. That's not what this is about. There isn't any competition in this thing. And let me tell you why. And I want you to be sure you hear what I'm about to say. The anointing in your life will only do what you were anointed to do. No more and no less. It will only do what, you're called, what, what you are called to do. Now, is there, any, is, there, is there anybody all anointed besides Yeshua, Jesus? No. The only one was him. See, that is the reason why that we need desperately to be able to unite instead of judging and, and murdering each other with the words that we speak is because none of us have all the anointing. None of us do. I wish that I had. I know after 30 years, I know what this anointing that's in my life does, and I know what it won't do. And there's things that it doesn't do. And people say, well, it does a lot. You bet it does. In fact, it does an awful lot. But the fact of it is, it doesn't do everything. And see, that, that, and that, that's what I want you to understand. Now, there are a few chosen of God. Now, these chosen vessels, well, let, let's, go, let's go to 22.14. 22.14. And, and take this a bit further. 22.14. says this. 
Again, for many are called, called but few are chosen. Well, that's nice. Let's go, let's, go to, let's go to Matthew 12, 18. Let's go further with this. Matthew 12, 18. But I want you to see that, that, that the Lord was serious about what he was saying here, and it wasn't a mistake. It's, it, it's, it's, it's Matthew 12, and it's the 18th verse. And it says this, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgments to the Gentiles. Now, of course we're talking about Yeshua, we're talking about the Son of Almighty God, Yahweh. The fact of it is, though, he said, I have chosen you. You're chosen. My beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased, I have put my spirit upon him. All right, that's what the anointing is. We saw in Saul, we saw in David, and there's others that we're not going to take the time to get to, just to use the illustration so you understand that when the Spirit of God is upon you, see, the anointing, and the anointing, now get ready, the anointing has to be activated. It has to be activated, and there's certain things that has to happen. And it can't be, it can't be Pastor Jojo, whatever his name is down the street, flopping around a bunch of oil on top of you. That's not where this comes from. It has to come out of the, out of the, out of the horn of the oil of the prophet or the apostle. Now, we, we talk about the apostles of the New Testament, and then all of a sudden, everything became apostles and prophets and, and whatever that was. Paul was both a prophet and an apostle, and so was Peter. Now, I've, I've got tapes that will describe to you the difference in the working of those offices and how they operate. But the fact of the matter is, what we have, what we have missed is just simply the way God does things, all right? So, so if you will now, go to the book of Acts with me. In the book of Acts, the first chapter and the second verse. Book of Acts, the second chapter, I mean, I'm sorry, the first chapter, the second verse. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he was through through the Holy Ghost has given commandment unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now who chose them? The Lord Yeshua chose them. Jesus chose them, didn't he? Now look in 9.15 of Acts. 9.15 of the book of Acts. 9.15. And it says here, The Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he, for he is a chosen vessel, talking about Paul, unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. Now, he is a chosen vessel unto me. Now, what I want you to, to, to look at and what I want you to understand is, again, they're, they're, everyone is anointed, all right? But there are chosen vessels of God. There are chosen men and there's chosen women. I wondered for several years when I got into the ministry and I kept questioning God because I was so naive that I thought that all the ministry worked the works of God. I, thought they, I just thought they did. I mean, you heard them preach it. I went to churches, didn't see anything. But I heard them up there saying, and I thought, well, you know, there could be things, this, things, that. But, but, I, but, but I never saw any evidence of it. And then I began, after about five years, I began to realize something. Not everybody could work the works. Not everybody was working the works of God. I began to cry to God, and I, I said to the Lord, I, I was on a 40-day fast, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I said, could you enlighten me? Because I said, I, I don't understand all this. Why is it that, 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 that you've anointed me, and I go out here, and the blind see, and the lame walk, the dead are raised, the, the, all this stuff happens. I said, can, I, 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 I said what, what's the deal? And listen to what God told me. He said, I've chosen you. And he said, I've anointed you to go forth so that you could demonstrate my power of the anointing. So that there would be that seed that would remain planted. He said, I have done that from generation to generation. And when you go back and if you go back and begin to study this thing, you'll begin to look at the Smith Wiggleworths of this world. And you'll begin to realize, I mean, Smith Wiggleworths was what a plumber of all things in this world, life. And, and, and God had chosen him from the foundation to carry the type of anointing that, that, that he carried. Uh, uh, Edder was the same way when she ministered. Uh, you go back to David, you go back to Paul, you go back to, you go back to Peter. These people carried these anointings as chosen vessels of God for only one reason, to demonstrate so that you and the church would have to agree that God still 
does miracles. And that's all that it is. It doesn't mean that I'm any holier than the next person. No, God forbid. It doesn't mean that, bless God, that I'm, that you know, that I'm this or I'm the, no, no, no. I'm a child of God. I was there when you were there. It happened to be that God somehow, I don't know whether, bless God, I was uh, the pup of the litter, litter that was sitting in the back of the room and he said, Deckard, come up here. I don't know how it happened. Doesn't make any difference how it happened. The fact of it is, it happened. I can't, you know, I used to, when I was young in the ministry, I used to go in and apologize to the, to the pastors because of the way the anointing worked in my life, my ministry. Because I knew they were jealous. And I said, well, pastor, I, you, you, know, you know, and God said, go back there and lay hands on that. I'm going to heal that. And I said, oh, God. It wasn't that I didn't want to. I knew I was upsetting the pastor. I knew I was causing the pastor to hate my guts. Why? Because he talked about the works, but he couldn't work the works. But there is definitely a difference in the chosen vessels, all right, than, than those that are anointed of God. And, and whether you like that statement or you don't like that statement, this book is full of that. And we have to be, you know, there, there is, again, there is a reason why I'm here this evening. I am here, and I'm going to teach you this weekend what I know about the anointing. And I am going to assure you when you leave here after this weekend that you are going to have a different concept altogether about the anointing in your life because that's what we're here about. We're not here about me. We're not here about what God does in me or what he's going to do in me. What we're here about is you. And we're here to do what? We're here, and like I said, when I get done this weekend, I'm going to take the horn of oil, and I am going to pour the oil upon you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to lay my hands on you, and I'm going to send you forth in the ministry. You say, well, I'm not sure I'm called to this. That. It doesn't matter what you're called to. We're all ministers of God. We're all ministers of God. Let, let, me, let me finish up here. <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in, in Mark, the 13th chapter... Mark 13, if you'll be so kind. Mark 13, the 20th verse. And the 20th verse says, Except that the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom the Lord hath chosen, he has shortened the days. Now, a lot of the church believes that the elect is the church. No, they're not. No, I'm sorry. No, they're not. You can't, you can't go back and, and translate that out of, back to the Hebrew and, and get that out of it at all. The fact of it is that God is going to shorten those days because of the chosen vessels that he has anointed and placed on this earth. Those of us that bless God that would, would manage to pay the price, gone out here and done the things that God wants done. So why? So that God can bring, bring forth his kingdom. And that's what God wants. That's what God, see, again, that's what God wants out of us. He didn't, he didn't you know, if you'll pick up those tapes that I did, especially those tapes that I did about holiness, you're going to hear me say some things that is, is, is exactly right. When God sits, when God brings the nations before him and he puts the, the sheep on one side and the goats on the other side, they've already been judged. And those, those goats and sheep is the church. They are the believers. They, they call themselves the believers on this earth. And what he says, if you didn't do the least of these, my brethren, you're, going, you're, you're burning, that's the end of it. And I don't care if you went to church three times a week, spoke in tongues, fasted 30 days every month, you're still going to burn. Why? Because you missed the mark. The way is narrow, folks. It's not wide. You can't go out here and wander around, do everything you want to do, and expect God to use you to raise the dead. That is what's wrong and what's been wrong within the charismatic movement and the Pentecostal movement. More so the, 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 the charismatics and the Pentecostals. And I know all of you have been involved somewhere along the line with the, with the charismatic movement. Dear Lord, my God, you go somewhere and they, they, they stand in the hallway and start prophesying to you. Can't even get, you can't even get into the meeting. So, Brother, I've got a word for you. I've got a word for you. I've got a word for you. Dear God in heaven. <laughs> well, where was I at? John, I, I'm, in, I'm in, in Mark. Uh, no, I went to Mark 13, 20, right? I got that one. Thank you. Let's go, let's go to John 15, 16. John fifteen sixteen. John fifteen sixteen. This is neat. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and, and whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
Now, how is he going to give it to you once that you go forth? Because you, he, he's chosen you, what? He's chosen you to be, what? Ordained. He's chosen you to be anointed. But he brought you, what, forth to do what? To bring forth fruit. And your fruit has to remain. If you have a judgmental spirit, what kind of fruit is that? Good or bad? It's bad. If you have a, a spirit of, if you sow discord, is that a good fruit or a bad fruit? It's bad. If you have jealousy inside of you, is that a good fruit or a bad fruit? It's bad. Now listen, he says that, that and, and you should go, uh, go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. And if you're not going to remain, then I got news for you. You can ask till the cows come in, and it's not going to happen. Please shake your head and begin to understand why it is that we can't produce the works of God. The anointing's there. there you know, but people say, well, the development of the anointing. Yes, there's the development of the anointing, and we're going we're to get into that tomorrow. But the fact of the matter is that you have to, you have to realize that, that, that the hang-up isn't God. That we're thinking that we're waiting on God for that very special moment to come along. And that's not, what we're, that's not what this is about. It's not waiting on God for this special moment to come along. What this is doing is God's waiting on you to produce the fruit that it remain. And when you produce that fruit that it remain, you know something? The rest of this thing will work out like a piece of cake. Let's go to the book of, the book of Revelation. And in the, in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, the 14th verse. 1714. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and they that are with him are called the chosen and faithful. The chosen and faithful. That pretty well covers the gauntlet, doesn't it? Let's end tonight in 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. You know, I, I, I think that one of the, one of the things that, that, that I personally believe is that when we get this thing right and people begin to see you know why we can be such a testimony because if you have never worked the works of God and now you're at a point where you are working the works of God doesn't it make sense that people are going to to do what people are going to to bless God to to sit up and take notice people are going to begin to come to you and say well what happened I never heard you ever talk about going out and, and God using you for blind eyes opening up and lame people walking. What's happened? And you know, by that point in time, you're going to be able to tell them what happened. Now, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Isn't that what the Bible says? That's right. And, and, and what I'm setting you up for is tomorrow because I want you to, I want you to understand in the 19th verses, second, uh, I mean, for, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, it says, quench not the spirit then the spirit can be quenched. Obviously, that's, that's what the scripture says. Don't quench it. If you quench the spirit, what happens? You push it down, you cause it not to work. It's that simple. Now, is, is, is there a fact that, bless God, because the callings, uh, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, that God cannot lift the anointing from you? I'm here to tell you, yes, he can, and yes, he does. And we're going to get to scripture tomorrow so that you can fully understand this. You, you know, we get to thinking that, that, number one, the gifts and the callings of God are, are, are somewhat taken out of context. Now, they happen to work with, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, those, the nine gifts. Now, those gifts and callings of God, it says, they are without repentance. Now, the anointing isn't one of that, all right? Uh, you, you, have to, you have to be ready to grasp a hold of and understand that, bless God, when he talks about the gifts and callings being without repentance, somebody that has a gift that's mechanical, God never takes that gift from them. You know that? Somebody that's got a gift that's mathematical, God never takes that gifting from them. And that is the true essence of of, of the teeth of what that means. Now, I don't have a problem with going over and putting that other, those other things into it. But the problem that we have done, we have gotten this thing into it saying, well, bless God, once the anointing comes, it's always going to work. No, it's not. No, that's where you are absolutely wrong. The anointing is not going to work just because you get to see it happen once. The, the, the things of God are like this. God, it, 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 to me, it's always been like, how many of you old enough here to remember the little rascals? Well, I hate to raise my hand, but I was there. 
And they had this, they had this mule or this donkey, and, and they had this carrot on a stick. And when they wanted that donkey to go, they, they just had a big old fish thing, and they just let that stick down in front of that, that donkey. And what that donkey did, he went forward like he was trying to get that carrot. Of course, he never could get it. I, I, I have often likened the anointing like that. That what God does with the anointing, he lets us participate just enough to get us hooked. And we keep going and we keep going, but we never quite get there. And you know when you're going to get there? It's when you enter into the kingdom of God on that day. And that's when we arrive. So you see, there, there, there isn't any such thing as, oh golly gee, uh, one more prayer and one more round of fasting and one more this. But isn't that really what the charismatic was trying to teach us when all that went on? And listen, I was part of the charismatic movement, so don't, don't think that, I well, he's against, no. I, I was there. I was in the Pentecostal movement. I understand the Methodist church. I, come, I was in that, the end of that when I began all of it. But, but, but what, I, what I began to see with the, with, with the charismatics was the fact that, 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 that it got to the, such a point that, bless God, that what we were told was that, bless God, that we just, you know, if you, if you do this and you do all that, then all your troubles are going to go away. You're always going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. You want a new Cadillac? Just get up every day and say, I get a new Cadillac. New Cadillac's going to appear. Now, folks, there are truths to the principles of those things. But the fact of the matter is, most of what the charismatic movement was into was your furthering your wealth. And some, your health, but mostly the wealth. Now, what is that? Well, again, we're going, we're going to do some talking tomorrow during the day about this. Because I want you to understand, that's not what the anointing is about. The anointing isn't to get you rich. I've, had, I've actually had people say to me, you know, you know, you know Prophet, if... You know, if you just come go with me to the horse track tomorrow, you know, I, I, I'd give 10% to the church. I said, I bet you would. Tell me, can, give me some numbers, uh, Prophet, so I, can, so I can begin to, you know, I can begin to uh, 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 win the lottery, some of the lottery money. And you see, that isn't what it's about. That's not what it was ever about. What it is about is furthering God's kingdom. And if it's not furthering God's kingdom, what's it doing? Then it's tearing God's kingdom down. And that's where I think, that's where I think that the whole thing becomes, becomes precarious at best for the church is because I think at this point in time, nobody is real sure because we went through all of that. We went through the seven steps to get to heaven or the, the 20, 25 ways to, to learn to pray. And guess what? It didn't work. And now we're sitting here, and we're all sitting here, and we're saying, okay, what's the newest and next greatest seminar coming along? And then we went through the time, remember when that, uh, Brother Brown went across the country, and you all got together and laughed and fell on the floor? Remember all that had happened? Huh? Sure, sure you do. Was that a God? No. That, that is joy of the Lord? Yes, it's true. But God is not going to have, you, you, the, you know something? Service is the Word of God. That's what the, the, the whole, God, uh, church is a place to come that you can learn. It, church isn't a place to come to be entertained.